come behold the works of God, the nations are his feet. Welcome to the teaching ministry of Calvary Chapel Corinth with Senior Pastor Charlie Villard. We're an expositional teaching church with a mission to comfort those in any affliction with the comfort in which we ourselves have been comforted by God. We're glad to have you join us today, so let's open up our Bibles and begin our verse-by-verse study in God's Word. Matthew chapter 10, let's begin reading. Um, it says, uh, verse 1, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And the names of the twelve apostles were these first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, and John, James the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Le- uh, Labaius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And Jesus said to the twelve, sent it, that these twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belt, not, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for the worker is worthy of his food. Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who, it is, who in it is worthy, and stay there until you go out. And when you go to the, into the household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Whoever will not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So let's, we'll go back and start breaking it down, and we'll continue reading. My plan is to get through the entire chapter. Uh, So... Now we have this, uh, we know this multitudes and the, you know, these disciples, these people have been following. They're a group of believers and a group of maybe not, not yet believers, but people who the Lord has been serving. And he says, he calls his 12 disciples, these 12 men that are closest to him. These people, the Lord called himself. Um, you know, the, the, they'd be later referenced as apostles, we call them that, um, you know, because a disciple is anyone who's a follower of Jesus. Apostles, that title means two things. One, it's a title given because these people walked with the Lord Jesus on this earth. And the second is that he sent them out. So we have two sort of qualifications that I see as an apostle. We'll see, you you see people in different denominations and churches use the word apostle, apostle John, apostle James, um, the title, it really simply means being sent. And if God sends you, then you're somewhat apostle. But if you don't, to me, you don't meet the second of qualification, that's a title you really shouldn't have. We're all disciples of the Lord if we follow him. Some of us will be called teacher. Some of us will be called pastor. Some of us will not have an official title, really. But the Lord sends us. But if we haven't walked directly with him, I think, to me, it's in poor taste to have the word apostle in front of your name. It's a bit presumptuous. Um, now, some people would argue that Paul was an apostle and the Lord had already died, but the Lord met Paul in person, came, sat with him, discipled him. So he sort of fits that, he, sort of, he fits that second qualification. Um, so the Lord says, hey, you guys, I'm going to start sending you out into all these places. He gave them power, it says. Um, what kind of power do these guys have? They have power to... Um, clean, cast out unclean spirits to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. You know, we talked about this a little last week and the week before, and we talked about it when we did spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians, right? That I don't, I don't have more power than you. It's not how that really works, right? It's the Lord who fills us with things. So when I lay hands on someone, I'm not laying hands on them going, I know I will heal this person. Or I'll touch their forehead and they're going to fall on the ground and it's going to be this whole big spectacle, right? That's, it's a farce. It's not how that works. When we lay hands on it, we are asking God, based on the fact that we're laying hands through us, 
to fill us with his spirit and to do a work in someone's life. It's just a, a special, more special than praying. We really should just lay a hand on everyone when we pray on them anyway. But there's not power quite like this. This was, this was very different. It's not that God doesn't do these things and he doesn't heal. He does, but he chooses those. So he gives them this power, this Holy Spirit, before it's even named. And he, you know, Matthew lays out the names. And actually, if you look in other Gospels, I think in, it's in Mark and maybe in John, they're all laid out very similarly. Peter always the first. Doesn't mean he's the best, it's just how he lays it out. But he does the groups of brothers first, and then he follows up with the, the, the I don't know what you call them, singles. It's a little weird way to say that, but non-brothers. So this is now the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who we know, we know as Peter. That's the name that the Lord gave him. And Andrew, his brother, James and John, he references the sons of thunder, the two, two men who would later go, who's going to be the greatest of the disciples? Can we sit next to you? Can we be where you are? We want to, we want to be next to where, we want to drink of the cup you drink from. And he's like, yeah, you, you guys aren't going to be able to drink from the cup that I drink from. Even has the, like mom in the you know the course of the conversation. I imagine it like the loving mom, like oh man, my sons are great. You're gonna love them, and really they're kind of boneheads. Um, but uh, he goes on to say Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Um, some scholars say that these might have likely been the groups they were sent in with the leaders of them. You know, if uh, the group of the brothers go out, Peter a leader, then Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew. James, the son of Alphaeus, Alphaeus, Alphaeus. Um, it's earlier referenced Matthew is the son of Alphaeus. Uh, there's some people believe that they might be a brother. Uh, there's no real actual evidence because it's never really referenced again and it doesn't say brother. Um, but it, uh, this is James the lesser, he might be called sometimes. And it's not like he stinks and he's just not cool because the other James was better. It would be like the younger. He'd be like James of the younger is how, is how they would reference it. And you think about these being written, um, you know, the Lord had already died. He had gone, been resurrected, gone to heaven. James, his half-brother, and Jude, his half-brother, um, wrote books as well. So these, all these men traveled together. So they reference him as James the Lesser. Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who we all, we all know. Who we do not name. I mean, think about it. There's a lot of kids named after these, right? The, Peter's a good name, Andrew, James, John, Matthew, Thomas. I have not met a Judas yet. I've met a Jude, which really is like a short for Judas. I don't, it, I don't know, it's a cool name, but I'm not sure I'd use that. Jude went by that, so he was never really um, mixed up with the whole Judas thing. So in verse 5, it says, The twelve Jesus sent out commanded them, say, it's an interesting word, phrasing, right? He commands us to go do things. He sends us. He sends us as a command, not you have to do this or you'll die. He says it as a powerful statement to go do these things. And we do right by listening to him. He says, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans. So the mission at this point for these men as he says in the next verse, is to go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He didn't send anyone at this point, the Lord himself, to Samaritans, Gentiles, us, right? Lord, if you're a Jew, not you. He, the Lord always had a plan for everyone in the world, salvation for every person. But it was to the Jew first and then to the Greek, as Paul would reference. So he says, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans. We already know the Lord's already going to have spoken to a Samaritan woman at some point, right? He did this ministry. But he's sending them out to the people that are lost, that are God's chosen people. So he says, go out to the house of Israel. And he said, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I mean, another way to say that would be, God's here. Be, be aware. Repent now. Now is the time. And this is the same thing the Lord went. We, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting because we don't really use that phrase. Like, I don't meet someone and go, hey, the kingdom is a hand. Repent of your sins. Uh, my name is Jim. Uh, that's great, but you still need to repent. I mean, ideally, if we're being sent by the Lord, every morning I should just stand, every Sunday morning I should stand up here and say, repent for the kingdom is a hand. Leave it at that. That's what the Lord said. But he says to do what? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, 
raise the dead, cast out demons. Go do works. Go be with the people, the lost sheep, he says. He sends these people to go preach the gospel, the good news, that the kingdom is at hand. God is here. To the people of Israel. He says, provide neither gold nor uh, freely, sorry, the last half of it, freely you have received, freely give. It's an important thing, right? It doesn't cost you to hear the gospel. You don't have to pay $10 for a ticket to get in to hear it. It's free. It was given to me free. I give it to you free. You don't pay me. I don't take a salary. I don't want one. I'm, this, is my, this is my calling from God. And I, I go to work every day. I do those things. The, the money that is given to us is to, we can grow the church. We can pay for, you know, rent eventually. If we've been blessed because it's been provided to us. But, you know, those things are for the building of the ministry, not for us. It's not for me to make gain financially off of preaching the gospel. And I learned from my pastor, who I admire dearly, um, you know, he, when he travels, he doesn't, he doesn't get paid. He just says, buy my ticket. So I, the church doesn't have to pay for me to travel. You buy my ticket, I'll go, and that's it. And now, actually, what he does is say, don't even, you know what? Whatever, all, all I want you to do is wherever I come and speak, give an offering to Blessed Hope or Seven Oaks, CRD. Seven Oaks of Blessed Hope, what it used to be called, to CRD. Help a man or a woman get off of drugs, get off alcohol, get off anything that's life controlling. That's what I just want you to do. I'll come speak wherever you want me to. Just send an offering there. The gospel is not to be financed off. Because it was freely given. Who am I to charge people something? But the Lord gave to me for free. He says, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts. Don't take anything with you. You don't need money. Just go. Go. This is also, you know, probably opposite of what you would do in those days, right? To prepare, you'd go, well, I need to get money. I need to bring clothes. I need to pack. You know, I mean, if you're going to go on a trip, you know, to... I don't know, I'd say New York, but you just got back, so it'd be weird. Now, I don't know, if you're going to go to Florida, right? Okay, well, it's a good contrast. So it's, you know, snow on the ground. You're going to go to Florida. What are you going to pack? You're going to pack shorts, I would assume, because it's still going to be in the 80s. You know, maybe a tank top, maybe T-shirts. You know, I'll, I'll throw in a light coat in case it gets cool at night, which it really doesn't get cool at night. No, um, 87 pairs of underwear. Because, <laughs> you know, you're going to soak through underwear somehow when you, you, ever, you do that. You take 82 pairs of socks and 17 pairs of underwear when you go two days. But I wear the same pair of shorts for like five days in a row. It's the weirdest, <laughs> weirdest thing packing with that. Uh, it's a funny meme on the internet. It was like, does anybody else pack 22 pairs of underwear? Like they're going to go through eight pairs a day. It's the weirdest thing. You know, but he's saying, look, you're going to have to prepare, right? No, the Lord's going, no, no, no. No, you don't prepare. Go. You go now. You don't worry about these things. The Lord's going to provide. It's a, it's, a, it's a test of faith for them to travel about, to go and then wonder, like, well, where, what are we going to eat? How are we going to buy food? You know, we're going to be tired. Are we going to have new sandals? He says, look, provide neither of those things, nor a bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. It'd be awesome if he was like, nor multiple pairs of underwear. For a worker is worthy of his food. So what is he saying? Look, you're going to go. You're going to be on this mission, and you're going to do the work of the ministry, and you're going to work with the people. You're going to go be with them, be a part of them, you know, work with them, help plow their fields, help, you know, take, you know, I don't know, tent make, right? Tent making was a big thing, that's what Paul did, you know, help them make tents, be a part of them. Because as you work with them, the hospitality of those people, and you're giving, they'll provide to you, like, hey, you want to come over and eat dinner? Do you have anything? Like, no, I'm just on the mission for the Lord. Like, come over here. I'll give you this. Here's a coat. Don't worry about it. Right? God's using people to provide for that. He says, trust in, trust in me is what he's really getting at. He goes on to say in verse 11, now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there until you go out. So it's a qualification he gives here. Inquire who is worthy. Who's worthy to hear the gospel? Everyone. Everyone's worthy. So why would he even say this? Really what he's getting at is, you know, think about um, asking around. Like, hey, is there anybody sick? Anybody been struggling here? Anybody that might need someone to lay hands on them? Some hope. 
They need a message of freedom from bondage. He's saying, just ask around, right? Find those people. And he says, if when you go into that household or into a household, greet it, right? So they say, uh, you know, look, Joe down the street, he's, he got hurt at the job. His back is messed up. He's been in bed for a month. And you're like, wow, oh, you know what? I'm, we're going to go visit this guy, right? He needs hope, probably, right? We could today they'd be like, well, we might need a cortisone shot and just give him some uh, pain pills and he'll be back up on his feet. He'll be fine. He'll likely end up addicted to drugs and really not going to fix his back and he'll overdo it and he'll still hurt. So he says, find out where those households are. Go into them. Greet them. What was the greeting going to be? Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Can you imagine you knock on the door and be like, hey, is Jim here? Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. And you, then what? You stand there and they're like, okay, whatever. That, I'm not Joe. He's over there laying on the bed. You're like, oh, let me go over there and do that too. Man, how awkward these were. You know, I mean, you know, it's awkward when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knock on your door and you're like, oh. Do I really want to answer it? And they're like, I see you in there. Just just open the door. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. <laughs> Slam the door closed. <laughs> you know, but what he's getting at is you're going to inquire, you're going to greet them. And as you greet them and as you talk about your mission, they're going to quickly, you're going to quickly see, are they going to listen to you? Or are they not really into this message at all? Because right. he says, but it's, um, if the household is worthy, if they're willing to listen, if they, they seek it and they want to hear this message that you have, that's what he talks about worthy, not are they good enough, you decide. Right. They're stiff-necked people who are all about the law, who are ignorant to what's really going on in the world, or they're going to be people that are like, man, look, I see all the hypocrisy. I don't understand. I've been waiting on a savior. And he goes, great, I have the message for you. And they're like, yeah, come on in. Right? That's, that's what he's saying. And you think about the casting the pearls before swine is so reference, right? Or, or the dogs who return to their vomit. We don't, we don't give the precious jewels to people who aren't willing to hear or who are not going to use that. We don't give the gospel to every single person. Ray Comfort, right? the spectacular guy at giving the gospel and talking to people and just walking up on beaches and colleges and, and having a conversation. But he doesn't walk up and say, guess what? The good news is you can be healed of your sin. People go, well, what sin? I don't sin. I just live my life. I try to be a good person. Right? The conversation he has ultimately starts off with, do you, do you believe in God? Do you believe God's word? Do you lie? Do you cheat? Do you steal? You know, people go like, wow, I mean, I did. Do you swear? Well, I mean, everybody does. Right? They don't, they're like, yes, 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 I do that. Yes, I do that. Well, clearly I am messed up. Do you have a better message for me? Right? They always tend to argue like, yeah, well, everyone does that. Everyone swears. Everyone cheats. I mean, like, I try to offset it with good. You know, I do something bad. I do five good things. And then he's like, yeah, but you know what God said, right? And he gives them God's word. He uses the law. You've broken the law. And if you've broken the law, then you are without hope. You have no hope of knowing God. Well, I don't believe that. Well, that's great. You don't believe that. What evidence do you have? That that's not true because the Bible says that it is, right? And then depending upon the conversation, he'll offer up to them the gospel. You know, and there's times where he'll walk away. I'm like, okay, yeah, no problem. It's good. You know, if you ever want to hear, you know, about that, let me know. Because a person who's not ready to hear the good news, that's a pearl we're giving to them, and they're just going to trample on it, right? That's what he says. If they're worthy is not, are you good enough? If they're worthy, meaning if they're willing to listen. Um, so he says, if they are, let your peace come upon it, meaning be there, be peaceful among them, hear the good news, give them the good, I mean, give them the good news, they hear the good news, you know, build them up, tell them about the Lord and who he is. Whoever will not receive you, nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Man, that is so difficult. I don't know why. God says here, his will in his word, his will is for all to come to know who he is. But not all will. But I can't let that go. The person who hears the good news, that's great. I mean, I give them the good news and they go about their way. I'm more stuck and mired in the people that won't. And he just says, dust off your feet. You know? Okay, got to go to the next house. Just move along my way. 
Man, it's so personal for me. I can't do that. Like, why did they hear? What was wrong? Did I not say it right? Lay in bed going over all the things that you, you know, you think you did wrong rather than just dusting off your feet going, Lord, I'll leave it up to you. Well, they didn't want to hear. So he instructs them to do this. In 15, he says, assuredly, I say to you, so he's truly, truly, I'm telling you the truth. It will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why? Why would he even reference that? The land of Sodom and Gomorrah burned to its core, right into the ground. I mean, there's pieces, they, they you know, studies, um, Pastor Ken referenced it a bunch. I can't think of it, what it's called. Um, it's basically like evidence in the Bible or patterns of evidence, I think is what it's called. I've watched a bunch of them. And like the Sodom and Gomorrah, they go to where it was and they dig through the sand and they find pieces of glass, which is, you know, in order for glass to be made, they heat sand to like three, 4,000 degrees. I mean, it's, you can actually, they, they smelt like ores of metal or they cast things. They pack it in sand because sand won't change its shape once it's packed in and it won't change its consistency at a high heat level. But if you heat sand enough, it actually will become glass. They find pieces of glass in the ground where Sodom was, so three, 4,000 degrees, hotter than lava, right? Burned this, these cities to the ground. And he says, it'd be more tolerable for those people than for the people that you will give the gospel to and they won't hear it. It's a stark warning to those. And basically it's like, look, if they're not gonna hear it, then they're gonna answer to me. Just move about your way. Shake off the dust, move about your way to the next house because there are people that need to hear the gospel. Don't stay focused on those. In 16, he, he sends a warning to them. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of the wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. And it is not for you to speak, or it's not for it is not who you who speaks, but for the spirit of your father who speaks in you. So, you know, the Lord's kind and giving. He doesn't just send you on a blind journey. We're not we don't have blind faith believers. I don't just believe the Bible because it said something. I've tested it out, right? I've walked through life and went, look, there is nothing else in the world that has answered my hopelessness, my depression, my sin, my addictions, nothing but the Lord. He's real, right? But people have to see that. So you're going to go and you're going to testify. And you're going to testify to the things in my name. But what's going to happen is you're going to be persecuted while you're in. We don't even, we don't even understand the word persecution at all. Not in this nation. This nation came, the founding fathers, right? They came in seeking a free people, a free place where they could worship God the way that uh, free people will, uh, not under Catholicism and Catholic rule and religious rule or a king or a queen, right? They came to, to make a place where free people could be and they could worship God. And the government wouldn't get into the church's business. And the government wouldn't establish a, a, a state religion, which it has today. It has humanism as a state religion. Schools are filled with it. Colleges are filled with it. Jobs are filled with it. The government is filled with it. They established a religion. Everyone has religion. We all do. Religion doesn't equal Christ. Religion equals what you put your time and your energy into, what you worship. If you worship yourself, you're your own religion. But humanism, the, well, we're all human people, we're all good people, um, you know, we're all equal people. But yet the Constitution says we're all equal. The Bible was clear that we're all equal. The Bible's clear discrimination is wrong. Racism is wrong. But the world says, no, no religion, no religion can be established and in itself that is a religion. And he said, and you're going to be persecuted for these things because they don't believe what you believe. But you go tell them anyway. I send you out as sheep amidst the wolves. So he's saying, beware. You are a sheep. And you are going to be amongst your enemy. And they are looking to devour you up and silence you and kill you and keep you quiet. 
Therefore, be wise as serpents. And a serpent is smart, you know. I, the, de the devil, right? He's, he's not an idiot. He's a smart guy. Angel, whatever you want to call him, right? He's been doing this for thousands of years, right? Watching people, torturing them. He led Adam and Eve, you know, ultimately into sin, caused death. I mean, he knows what he's doing. He's smart. And it's snakes, they're not stupid creatures. They don't have hands. They don't have feet, right? So they're cunning creatures. They're slow, they're sneaky, they're quiet, filled with venom and poison. They watch their, you know, prey long before the prey even knows it's there. You know, you watch somehow, I like watching Planet Earth, you know, shows like that. I don't like the, this planet's billions of years old. That's just bull. But, you know, I like seeing how God has built creation. These natural mechanisms of uh, being a predator or being prey and how they defend themselves. It's all cool to see how God has um, built nature and then how it's adapted to sin, really. Because when we study apologetics and we talk about a worldview, we believe the world was created by God, that all animals, didn't, they didn't feed on each other. Sin brought that about. So the fall of man messed nature up, messed the whole world up. Man, all, the fall of man messed the whole entire globe up, right? It tilted it on an axis because God had destroyed things. So... When you watch them, right, each, each creature, each animal has this way of surviving in the wild. Um, you know, and a, and a snake, it's cunning. It, it listens, has good hearing, has a good sense of, uh, not hearing, a sense of, uh, taste the air, right? That's what their tongue's doing, flipping around. So they're going, oh, there's a, there's a mouse near. I gotta be quiet, because the mouse is gonna be mousy. They do mouse things, right? They snicker, they, their little nose goes everywhere, and, they're, they're smelling, they're looking around, they're real cautious, they're trying to, I mean, they have no real way to defend themselves. They got some claws and some teeth, but, you know, the snake tries to wait from behind, slowly sneak up on it to the point where it can do its thing. Some snakes coil and squeeze it to death and swallow it. Some snakes use poison, you know, and bite, and then wait for it to be paralyzed and eat it, eat it alive. Right? He's saying, you're going out, so be wise like the serpent. Don't be a serpent. Don't be cunning and evil. Pay attention. Because you don't have a natural defensive mechanism, you're going to be swallowed up if you're not careful. So we're to be wise. We're to be paying attention. Don't just walk out and, oh, God's going to just protect me. Well, it's going to be fine. No, pay attention. But he says, be as harmless as doves. Don't go out and harm people. Don't use the gospel to make your own gain. Religion has hurt people. The church has hurt people more than it, more than I would even like to see. I, I understand it. I saw it growing up. Man using religion and using the church for its own gain. That's not what God's called us to. That's not what Calvary Chapel stands for as a movement. It's not a denomination. It's a movement. Right? Of men blessed by God to be able to hear the scripture, interpret it, read it, apply it, and then want to go and take that message to others. So Pastor Chuck was doing. We don't, I don't stand here and tell you to do things. I read the Bible. I tell you what it says, you know, how I studied it, how I see it and, and how I apply it. And then you go do the same thing. And if we agree on that, then we meet back here again, the next service and do the same thing. A lot of churches tell you what you should or shouldn't do. I mean, up until, I don't know what the forties or fifties, uh, Catholic Church, you didn't read your Bible. They, they read it to you. And then people started reading and going, hey, what, this is kind of weird. This says something different than what you're saying. It's like, oh, well, you don't understand. Like, you can read your Bible. It's fine. Now, as a church, the, you know, the Catholic Church, like, you can read your Bible, but we interpret it for you. And we decide on these things, right? And it's like, no, that's not really how this works. Martin Luther, that's why he left the church. So be harmless. Don't use it to gain from people. Don't provoke people to, hey, look, we're traveling around. We're preaching the gospel. Um, do you know the gospel? I'm like, oh, I know the Lord. Great, great. Here's my cup. You want to put some money in there? Because we've got to go to the next house, and this is going to carry us on. It's going to buy us our, our uh, private jet to fly around the world in, you know, speaking the gospel when you could just fly coach and speak the gospel to the people you sit with. But be aware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogue. 
He's like, look, I'm going to lay it all out there right now. These people that don't like you, they're going to take you. They're going to capture you. They're going to scourge you. You will be beaten. I mean, it's really what broke the Lord's skin in his, um, you know, in his moments that he got beaten to the lashes, right? He ripped his skin open. You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. He's like, you're going to be brought before them and you're going to be scourged. The reason you're actually there is that you'll testify in front of them of me. But they're going to beat you. They're going to scourge you. And they will deliver you up. Do not worry about how or what you should speak. You know, I mean, it's, it's funny. It's like, I think about the Lord saying this, and he's always one step ahead, right? Because the Lord's a discerner of the hearts and the mind, and he can hear. He says, don't worry about what you're going to speak. He doesn't say, be courageous in the moments where they're whipping you. <laughs> it, it, to me, if they like sent me on a mission and, and Ken says, hey, you're going to go, go plant this church. Um, they're going to beat you when you get there, but, but be of good courage. You'll know what to say when you're there. I'd be like, I didn't know there was whipping involved in this. I, no one said that. Um, maybe this is not for me, right? They're worried about what they're going to say during those. I mean, that's dedication to an extent, right? Or they're just ignoring it. They're like, yeah, he's not what he's talking about. That would be fine. We just need to know what to say when we get to the front of these people. And he says, don't worry about that. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. What's, what holds you back from witnessing to people? Like just walking out on the street and being like, hey, I'm Charlie. How's life? You know, do you know the Lord? Most people will say, I don't know what to say. I'll just fumble. I'm not good at speaking. You don't have to worry about it. That. You don't have to be good at speaking. The Lord will fill you with the Spirit. That's what you should be praying. Lord, fill me with what you want me to say. Use me. That's, that's it. And he says, don't worry about these things. He's like, the, the Spirit will speak. In 21, he says, now brother will deliver up brother to death, and, father, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated for all my name's sake. So he gives them another stark warning, just so you know. It's, um, it's, it's interesting here. The Lord uses this. Did anybody heard of the crap sandwich? It's like a management strategy, right? You, it's a, you could use it with your kids too, right? It's really not called the crap. It's just the word we should use probably. But it's the, I'm going to tell you something good, followed by something bad, and then followed by something good. So it's easier to digest the bad thing because I told you two good things. It's a, it's a management tactic. But the Lord uses it all over the place. To me, he's the genius that invented it. He uses it in the book of Revelation, right? Tell you something good, but I have this against you. But at the end, if you endure, then you're going to have these, right? So it's like more palatable. So he says, you know, hey, you're going to go and you're going to be wise serpents, right? Be, you know, be, be harmless. Yeah, but they're going to beat you. But don't worry, because you have something to say, then you're going to have, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to fill you up. It's great. And then he goes on to say something bad again here where you're going to be put, put to death, right? It, he's telling them ahead of time, like all these things, you know, you're, you're going to have to in, in, endure these things, but you'll be hated. No one's going to like you. He's giving you fair warning that when you tell the truth, there'll be people that don't like it. And he follows it up with something good. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So this is an interesting one. You'll be hated for his name's sake, but he who endures the end will be saved. And they persecute you in this city, flee to another. So he's not saying be stupid, take the beatings and just die getting a beating. He's saying if they're persecuting you, leave. It's okay. Be smart about this. Go to the next city. The gospel needs to be heard. So you take the, go testify to the government. They beat you. They send you out. Leave. Go to a different city. You're not a coward. You're, I'm not asking you to stay in only that city. I'm asking you to endure and to continue on your journey. He who endures will be saved. Endurance is a thing that is very difficult. It's hard because it's hard to endure when you seem beat up, right? Or you feel beat up or you just can't seem to get ahead or everything seems to go wrong. 
He says, I tell you the truth. I say to you, you will have not gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is a weird one. This almost sounds like to me what he means is, is you won't have finished your gospel journey and I'll have died and come back in judgment, which means we've missed the war. And he already came back. Really, though, what he's getting at, and there's all kinds of you know, theories and studies on this, Really, what he's pointing to here, at least the major opinion and the one I agree with, is what he's talking about is what happens in A.D. 70. In A.D. 70, the Roman government overthrew the Jews and broke their government down and sent them out. That was God's judgment on Israel for not hearing him. He, the, the Son of God, God will return in Revelation. We have not yet met that time. Prophecy has not been fulfilled. Major scholars agree that what he's saying here is, it's like, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to die, but you're going to be on your journey. But before all the cities of Israel hear the gospel, I'll come back. What really could have been the course of a, two months. He's saying, you're going to go and you're going to do this thing. The book of Acts is filled with their journeys all around Israel, outside of it, Macedonia, all across you know, Europe and Asia. It's a warning to those that there's a judgment coming for what will happen. The denial of the Lord. And in AD 70, the Roman government saw that end, saw to f seek the end of the Jews, tore apart his government, and scattered the Jews everywhere. And they were scattered until they were put back in Israel in the 1940s, right after the you know, Holocaust. So in this, it's not a, oh, we've missed the Lord, or he is he's made a mistake because... He's prophesied something that already is going to come to pass, and then Revelation is then written way late in John's life, 50, 60, 70 years later. He's saying, no, there's a problem coming for the city of Israel, the people of, of God. They're going to be torn apart, and, and that is their judgment for denying the Lord. Make sense? In 24, it says, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant be like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they have called those of the house to those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. The people of Israel, the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish government, is not above God. They're not above the Lord. The Lord is above them. He's saying, don't worry about this. <laughs> they are the servants of God. I'm here to tell them these things. And judgment is coming to them if they don't repent and turn from their ways. Right? Even Stephen, we have in the book of Acts, Stephen's long conversation in front of them. Right? They're about to kill him, and he goes, all right, I'm going to lay this out for you. He goes through the, the, the entire Bible and in Scripture up to the point of the Lord's life. And in the end, they're beating him and kill, going to kill him. And he looks up, and heaven is opened, and there's the Lord standing for him. And like, that's what you were supposed to do. Don't worry about whether or not they believe. Tell them the truth and move about your way. Leave them with the truth. Do not fear them. In 27, it says, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. So this is really, as the law of first mention goes, right? This is the first time the Lord's saying, tell people these things. He tells all the people he does the miracles to up until this point, like, don't say anything. Just go do your thing. Go about your way. Don't tell anyone. He's saying, no, what I tell you. And this makes me think about the Sermon on the Mount, right? He gave all these pictures, all these things, picture of what heaven was going to be like. And who we were to be as disciples of Christ. He says, go tell all those people. Tell the people that are going to be disciples. Tell all the things that I've told you. Tell the truth to everybody. This is going to happen. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, because they cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Him is capitalized in your Bible, I hope. Fear God. Don't be scared of God, totally, right? I mean, there's 
Fear here, when it's referenced in the Bible in different ways, right? This one is, is a respect. Have a healthy fear for something. Um, you know, the ocean. We shouldn't be stupid when we're in the ocean, right? The ocean, it can kill us in, in, in an instant. It can pull us under in the undertow, pull us out, and suck us under, and that's just it. We aren't strong enough. We cannot defeat the ocean. We should have a healthy respect for it. We shouldn't fear it. You know, we should be able to go enjoy it, watch it, you know, swim in it, ride some waves. I, I love doing that, like bodyboarding, like body surfing type in, bodyboarding. <clears throat> so we shouldn't fear something because if we fear something and it's only true fear, we, we will just, well, I'm not even going to go near it. Don't even want to talk about it. Don't even want to hear about it. Guns, you know, the guns are the same way. They're, they're a dangerous tool. They can take a life. I mean, that's what they're made for, right? Take a life, whether it's a hunting rifle or a pistol. Taking a life of something, you have to take great care of it. You don't just throw it around. You don't get on TikTok, spinning it around in your hand, being stupid, because it looks cool. It's a, it's, a, it's a tool, but you have to be trained. You have to be prepared to use it. You should be prepared, because there might come a time when you have to defend your own life. And we have that right in this nation to defend ourselves even from a government. But if you don't learn about it, practice it, understand how it works, right? Break it down, see its mechanisms, learn about it, use proper safety precautions, right? Then you just become scared of it. You don't want anything to do with it. And the time comes that you could have defended yourself. You can't. So what he's saying is fear God, respect God. He's able to what? Destroy the body and the soul. These men, they can't destroy the soul. They can destroy your body. They can take your life. But they can't kill your soul. But when you're done with all of this stuff at the end of the day, and someone wants to kill you, you're going to heaven, I hope. Right? We know the Lord, you're going to heaven. And he says, God is the one we should be fearful of. We should respect him. He's able to kill the body and the soul in the hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear. Therefore, you are of more value than any sparrow. So he says, look, two sparrows from a cobble coin. They're like, that's nothing, right? You buy chickens for like, Corey, what are you buying them for? Like two bucks. Yeah. Cheap. Like, yeah. Right, cheap. You could, like, that's a $2 chicken. If it dies, no big deal. I don't have a very big investment in it. It's just two bucks. But God does, right? God knows life. God creates that. He's still in control of all those things. And sometimes you're going to buy chickens. Some will die. Some will live. You know, take care of them. But trust God. You know, I mean, I suppose you, you don't just throw them out in the lake, you know, on a lake of ice and expect that they'll figure it out, right? You, you feed them and you, you give them a place, right? God cares for them. He wants us to care for nature. But the sparrow figures out how to eat and flies around and makes a nest. But when it dies, the Lord knows. He sees it. I, he's kept account of all things that have died over the course of time. They're his creation. The fall of man has ruined that. It has brought death amongst it. So don't fear. God will take care of you. In 12, he says, therefore, <clears throat> sorry, not 12, 32. Uh, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, he, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. If you have anything you highlight, highlight verse 32. It's God's promise. If you confess the Lord Jesus in front of people, he will confess you before his Father. Meaning when we are done this life, we go stand and we go to heaven, right? There's a judgment seat. We're not even going to stand there if we're in Christ. We're going to go to the, you know, Bema seat. We're going to be um, rewarded for all the works that we've done for the Lord. We're not going to stand in the the, you know, the great judgment of sending people to hell, right? They're gonna, we're gonna go, we're gonna stand before the Lord and there's like little videos guys will do sort of little parodies about it, right? You're gonna go into heaven and then this guy's gonna come along and he's gonna like, you know, bring out this rap sheet. If you were here Thursday, I was talking about how, you know, Bangor PD at one point looked up how many times I've been stopped and been in trouble and it was just like long list and I regretted it at that moment. Like, oh man, I wish I'd never done any of those things. Now you see them all. I want to be a cop. I don't want to have done that. All right? So this guy's going to come out in heaven and go, boom, here's God's book. I've written everything you've done wrong. 
And we're gonna go through them all. And then this other guy's gonna come in and he's gonna go, no, no, just, he's gonna, he's gonna do the cool movie thing and just go rah, and wipe the table of all that. He's like, this guy's on my account. I took that. He's free, right? That's what the Lord's saying. You confess me in this life. I'm gonna go before my father and go, no, he's with me. He's one of the ones you gave me. That one, you gave me that one, that one too, that one, they're all with me. Those guys, I don't know those guys. Right? And the Lord said it, they're gonna go, Lord, Lord, but I cast out demons in your name. I healed the sick in your name. Judas Iscariot, didn't he go and do these things? He did. He was with them. He was doing those. And the Lord's gonna go, I didn't know you. Sorry, I don't know who you are. And I'm not taking you on my account. Whoever denies me before him, I will deny before my father. Man, that's, that's good of God, is it not? Look, sin entered the world. We're all born into it. All of us have sinned. Me, you, everyone. All of us have not met perfection like the Lord required. So he made a way. And we can be arrogant and not choose the way and go, I don't accept your conditions. You'll accept me the way that I am. I've worked out well in my life. I've done good things for the bad that I've offset. And, and if you don't accept that, then well, I'll just go to hell. Oh my gosh, that is such a stupid statement. The stupidest, really. You don't even know what hell's like. You haven't visited it. I mean, have you gone to Florida in the middle of the summer? It's worse than that. It's like you walk outside and you <gasps> can't even catch my breath. We went on our honeymoon to the um, Southern Caribbean. You know, we went on a cruise and it was cool. It was really super cheap and we got to see all kinds of cool places. You know, you're on the like ship and you know, you're in air conditioned room and all that stuff, right? And then you, you get off the boat to go and you're all excited and you walk out and you're like, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. It's, it's so humid. What is, the, what is the deal? You're instantly sweating, your clothes are soaked and you're like, well, I'm, this is terrible. How do we, let's get to the beach and cool off in the cool water and the water's 90 degrees. <laughs> You know? And it's tropical. I don't. Hell's not going to be like that. It's gonna, I imagine it's going to be like boiling lava, and 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 you're you're going to want to drink, and you're all you're going to do is be parched, right? That was the picture in the Gospel of Luke, Abraham's bosom, right? He's the guys reaching across from hell, going, "Can I just have a drop of water on my lips? It's so dry. All I want is to drink. I'm so parched." And he's like, "I oh, don't know. Can't do that." I. So, look, you know, I, I think God's conditions. It's not like I wasn't arrogant and said the same things in life. And then at the end of my life, right, when I'm done with it, going, I'm done. I've rationalized suicide. I'm going to do it. <sighs> Whatever I invest in, I should know what's going to happen when I close my eyes for that last time. And that sort of launched me on this journey. Like, what really has happened? You know, I grew up with that Catholic, you know, saying is that you take your own life and suicide, then you're going to go to hell. Was that true? I'm like, I don't believe anything else they say. Why would I even believe that one? But that one stuck with me. So it's like, well, I probably should know. And we went to, you know, through other life circumstances and troubles in our marriage and troubles in life. We went to a church and this guy preached the gospel, told me about Jesus Christ. And in that moment, this passage, these conditions, I was like, yep, I'll take those because I suck at life and it's not working. Yours definitely sounds better now. So we can take it. That's, that's the struggle. The question is not, was Jesus Christ a real person? This history says that. There's no argument. No point in even talking about it. Don't even discuss it with someone. I'm like, no, Jesus Christ was a real person. History says that. The question is, is he the son of God or is he crazy? That's what we have to deal with. Do we believe him or do we not? And 34, it says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Oh, man, all the Christmas cards that just like mean now nothing. <laughs> Joy, peace on earth. Oh, man, I did not come to bring peace on earth. People are like, there's no way Jesus, the Bible, this was in the Bible. We're like, yeah, no, it, it, it is the case. We talked about it a little on Christmas Eve, right? The peace that they talk about in the gospel was peace with God. Not peace on earth, like it's, everything's going to be great, the hippies in the 70s, right? It's just all going to be great. We're all going to just get along. It's not what he was talking about. He's going to 
continue on in that. He says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's... That was great. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. <laughs> a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Mm. He who loves the father and mother or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. God's conditions on this, you do this or else, are what we should accept. And he says, I, I didn't, you're, it's not going to be a peaceful life. I didn't come to do that. I didn't come to give you these things. It's not what I'm here for. I came to divide the believers and the unbelievers, the religious and the non-religious, the sick and the healthy. The, the Pharisees come and talk to him, and he's like, I didn't come for the people that don't think they're sick. I came for the people that think they're sick. People are like, well, you just believe in Christianity because it's a crutch. Oh, yeah, it's a crutch. It's like, because I'm, I'm basically paralyzed in life without the Lord. I couldn't do anything right. Couldn't, nothing works. Of course it's a crutch. I need that. Pride doesn't allow people to see their need. So the Lord, he came to bring pieces of baby on earth, right? Sort of. Peace between us and God the Father. We are no longer now forever lost. The good news when he was born was, I came so that you would have life and life abundant. But he came to bring a sword. In 740, he who receives you, he who receives you receives me. And he who receives me, uh, he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives me. You receives me. So the people that you go visit, the people that receive you, they're receiving God. If you're not God, just let just be clear. They're receiving the Lord. That's what we're bringing to them. And those who receive us and him receive the Father. Because he is the picture, right? He is the human representation of God the Father. And people are like, Jesus never said he was God. They never read any of these things, clearly. You just repeat what you hear from other people. Because Jesus says, he comes on behalf of God the Father. In 41, it says, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. The Lord's, you know, ending of this conversation and sending, you know, this ends the conversation he has with his disciples and he sends them out, right? He's instructing them, go in my name. I'm going to tell you what you're going to face so you're not surprised. You know, sometimes it's, it's hard for us, right? Because, you know, our first question may be like, well, what do I wear? What should I bring? Where are we going? If I just said, hey, we're all going on a church trip. You know, first thing they'd be like, where are we going? Well, I'm not going to tell you where we're going. You'll see when we get there. Okay, um, well, I, what is it going to be? Warm? Is it going to be cold? It doesn't matter. Just don't worry about that. We're, we're, when we get there, you'll see. I know, but like, how do I prepare for this? Do I need to bring spending money? Do I, what are we going to eat? Do I, should I prep some snacks? You know, should I bring my little, you know, uh, neck pillow when I'm sleeping on the plane? You know, like, are we going to fly? It doesn't matter. We're going on a journey. Don't worry about it. And we're going to go preach the gospel. Now imagine if we're all said that, right? And I'm like, man, it's just going to be glorious. going to be awesome. We're going to go preach the gospel. And you're like, oh, we're gonna, where are we going to preach it? We're going to be like, maybe we'll be in Florida because we'll get away from the sun. It'll be great. Maybe it'll be in some other country. Maybe it'll be in Africa. We're like, I don't really want to go to Africa. I don't know what I'm going to eat because they eat bugs and weird things. And they have, like, disease. But I didn't tell you to go get your shot, so it's probably not going to be Africa. You know, and then I go, well, it's awesome. We're going to go to downtown Bangor. We're going to walk around and just talk to people. Oh, I'm really busy today. I'm not going to be able to make that trip, right? These guys, I'm sure they're, they're, they're human beings. They're going to be like, well, what do, we, what do we bring? How much money do you have, Peter? Like, we're going to have to have enough money to go. So wherever we go, 
I want to buy souvenirs. Like I got to buy a postcard. I want to buy the shot glass. I want to, you know, whatever. I want to have all these things that I come back from my journey on. The Lord's like, you might not come back from your journey. And by the way, while you're gone, you're probably going to be beaten. And it's going to be in my name, right? So they're probably going to beat you extra. <laughs> and it could be bad, right? And you're going to have places where people aren't going to receive you. And you're going to have to go. And you're going to be persecuted. And it's probably not going to be all fun and games. And their thoughts probably, wait a second. I heard the prophecy. I thought you came to bring peace on earth. We're going to go give a good message and people are going to receive us well. And he's like, yeah, guys, I didn't come to bring that peace. I came to divide. When you tell the truth, it's going to divide people. Go preach the gospel to somebody you love and watch how quickly it divides your relationship. Maybe they'll accept it and it'll be great. And you'll have a closer fellowship. And you go, well, you're, you should hear me out. You're my mom. And the Lord's like, moms, dads, mothers-in-law, sisters, brothers, don't, don't, those things don't matter. What's important is that you tell them the truth. You accept what comes along. And you move on to the next one. There's a... I hate to leave it, like, sort of <coughs> depressing. But, you know, that's, that's part of what it is going on a journey with God. There's going to be trials. There's going to be battles. There's going to be times where you're going to doubt. John the Baptist, the greatest prophet of all, the greatest human man living that lived was what the Lord called him. And he's sitting in a prison going, did we pick the right guy? Is this truly the right Lord? Can, hey, disciples of mine, can you go back and ask him, are you really the one or should we be waiting for someone else? And that dude's head got delivered up on a silver platter, quite literally. And he's like, oh, I don't know. This is not what I was expecting. I was hoping for someone else. I was hoping for a guy who was going to come overthrow the Jewish government. He was going to bring peace on earth. And he was going to be a king. And I seem to have missed that guy. That's the Jewish message right there. I've missed that guy, so I'll just have to continue to wait. So 2,000 years later, they're still waiting. 2,000 years later, hopefully all of us know the Lord. And we know times are going to be tough. There are going to be struggles, going to be battles. But he says, take heart, be of good courage. I've overcome the world. They, hated, they hate you because they hate me. They don't hate you. Don't take it personally. They hate me. And you represent me. You take me with you. You bring the message that I have for you. When they receive you, they receive the Father. God the Father. And when they don't, I'll deny them. It's on them. So go, you know, give the gospel. Be a good witness. You know, show others the love that God has shown us. Tell them the truth. You know, if you're a missionary, you're going to go and probably going to speak to all kinds of people and not have really deep relationships with them. That's not my calling. This is what I wanted. Man, I wanted to be, be able to teach God's word, but be able to fellowship with you all and get to know you all and spend time with you here on this earth and build this church I'm building this church, God, right? But God builds a church, right? And then you go and you do those things. And then you come back and you go, oh man, I, I did some witnessing and it didn't go well. And, you know, we lay hands on you. We hug you. We tell you, we love you. It's okay. It's not you that they don't, that they're denying. It's God. It's all right. They denied the Lord. It's not you. Go back out to the next one and keep going, right? To be encouraged back up. That's the point of the church, right? Bring them in, encourage them, teach them, disciple That's what happened with the kids, right? So all the work that we're doing to prepare is to start teaching and continue teaching these kids the foundation of what we believe. So they don't have to spend a lifetime not knowing the truth. Or if they walk away for a season and then life struggles, like, you know, set in and then they go, oh man, you know what? I remember learning about God. I remember learning about God's conditions. Man, like my prodigal son, right? His conditions got to be better than what I'm doing right now. I'm living with someone who doesn't care about me, just uses me for sex, or living on drugs and alcohol, barely surviving, homeless. Whatever the conditions might be, 
God's conditions have to be better than this. And this is right. Just lay down your life before me. Pick up your cross and carry it daily. That's a, that's a big, big job for us because we're too prideful and arrogant to want to do that. I'd be like, well, I'll pick up my cross after I'm done doing my thing, right? I got to do a workout. I got to get my coffee in. I got to watch my show, you know, do whatever. Now he says, as soon as you wake up, man, pick up your cross. Start carrying it. Then I'll be with you while you're doing that. I'll give you the words to speak. I'll empower you. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. If you have any questions or would like to request prayer, you can visit us online at www.ccquarrant.org. If you're local, come join us for a service at 125 School Road in Charleston, Maine. We want to remind you that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Remain armored up, and until next time, grace and peace.